Welcome to the June Mac meeting. We're just getting letting everybody in right now. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Uh, like there was like a gust of chill wind that happened in the middle of the night, <laughs> and my window was open, and I was like, "Whoa." Oh, so I had to wake up and I was like, am I cold? Like, no. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It cannot be happening. <laughs> yeah, I'm enjoying the break in the heat today. Yeah. So did anybody else get like um, a canceled um, invite? No, okay. I added a couple of people to the invite for today and it canceled it on mine, but then I sent it out really quickly. Hi, Gisa, how are you? Sorry to miss our meeting last week. Okay. We have a lot of time to catch up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Hey, Topher, long time to see. Hey, Angel. How's it going? Good. Enjoying the summer so far. Me too, although it's a little hot, like somebody else was saying. Yeah, I'm in Oregon, and it's been kind of chilly lately. Today's our first, like, summery day. But... Ooh. Yeah. Hey, heads up, my uh, computer has yeah. um, been making a weird noise during, uh, like, meetings and stuff. I okay. can't hear. So if you hear some weird noise going on, let yeah. me know. Make sure and go mute. Okay, that sounds good. We can hear you fine right now. Cool. So that's good news. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just looking to see, make sure we have all of our panelists before we get started. Um. So I see Topher. I see Rebecca. Um. Let me see. Stephanie is Stephanie on? I don't see Stephanie. I think we're just missing her. Um. Because Natalie's here too. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, Natalie, stuff. Yeah. Uh, oh, Robert, Robert Morris. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started, um, and then we'll just start with the panel discussion, um, and we'll just wait for them if they come on a little bit late. So, welcome to the June Mobility and Access Coalition meeting. Um, next slide. So um, obviously you all are here, so you're in Zoom, but I just wanted to let you know that um, the Zoom invite that you received probably also has a one-click call-in. So if you lose internet connection, then um, you should be able to call in that way. Um, sometimes with our panelists, like we've had some audio issues and so they've had to call in um, on their phones, their devices. So just keep that in mind and we'll just play it by ear um, and give everybody a little bit of grace with technology. Next slide. Um, go ahead and next slide. Um, so this is the one call click um, that you'll be able to just call from your phone. Next slide. Um, and then right now uh, we just ask that everybody keep themselves on mute unless they're speaking. Uh, we do have a panel discussion today. So the panelists will just um, unmute themselves and mute themselves um, as they speak. Um, if you're a panelist, we appreciate it if you turn on your um, your camera, if you can, just that way we can see um, you communicate. It helps with um, communication a little bit better. You can see the other people who are on the call by clicking on the participants. Um, and then right now, I just ask that everybody put their name and their organization in the chat. This helps us take um, do the minutes and know who's here um, so that we can follow up with people. Next slide. So um, for those of you who might be new to the MAC, uh, really we focus on transportation access for underserved populations. We really believe that transportation access is access to opportunity. It helps people improve quality of life and meet their basic needs. Um, on the right here, you see a pedal graph that talks about all the social determinants of health and really how um, access to all of them really um, has equity at the center. So we try to make sure that people have multiple options to get around through multimodal transportation options. Next slide. 
So here is our agenda today. We're going to start with a panel discussion, then we'll have some updates um, that we'll go into, and then we'll conclude and talk a little bit about next month, which will be in person. Um, so next slide. So just wanted to say that um, the county does celebrate Juneteenth, observed Juneteenth, and so the county offices will be closed tomorrow. Um, I don't know how many other organizations um, are closed tomorrow, but just wanted to bring that up for y'all because um, um, I believe it's relatively new. I think the last four years we've been, um, it's been observed as a holiday for Boulder County. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna get to um, the panel um, discussion started. So we have uh, five panelists today and we'll go ahead and have all of them introduce themselves, but we have Rebecca Seiden, who is a Boulder County employee. We have Topher Downham, who works for the city of Boulder. We have Robert Morris, who works for Boulder County as a work um, at, in the Workforce Center. We have Natalie Calson, um, who works for Abbey Care, and we have Stephanie O'Neill, who is with um, Dr. Mack. So I know that we have a few people that we're still waiting on, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I have a list of questions. I just ask that all of the people um, in the meeting can put your questions in the chat um, and then, uh, or wait until the end for your questions. So we have, um, Jessica will be monitoring the chat just to make sure that we incorporate all of the questions into the questions that we have as we go. But we'll go ahead and get started. So I just ask, and I'll go ahead and call you all out. Uh, but um, just to start, Rebecca, we'll start with you. Can you please introduce yourself and talk about your organization's mission and how you serve individuals with disabilities? Sure. My name is Rebecca Seiden. Good afternoon. I serve as the IDD Mill Levy Program Coordinator, and I'm also the staff liaison for the IDD Advisory Council here in Boulder County. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the IDD Mill Levy Program today. Um, it's a crucial initiative that directly impacts the lives of many individuals in our community. It supports people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, brain injury, which sometimes I refer to as BI, and autism. And we strive to foster, in, foster inclusivity and promote a compassionate community, one that truly values our citizens with disabilities. The, our efforts are guided by our IDD, Boulder County IDD Needs Assessment, which was done in 2018. It includes critical areas for investment, which are housing, case management and systems navigation, advocacy, mental health, self-advocacy, uh, community engagement and social connectedness, community education and IDD awareness, and then ongoing monitoring and evaluation. And so the IDD Advisory Council supports recommendations for further investments in these areas. And the goal is really not only to meet immediate needs, but also to create sustainable needs, sustainable supports, long-term improvements in the lives of the people that we serve. Uh, I think you're muted, Angel. Thanks. There has to be one one um, unmute failure, like before we get started here. But thank you so much, um, Rebecca. You may have said this, but can you remind us what year the mill levy was passed? The mill levy was passed in two thousand two. Two thousand two. Yeah. So we have about twenty two years under our belt. Can't wait to learn yes. a little bit more um, about that. So next thank we'll you. go to Topher. Um, Topher, would you please introduce yourself, talk about your organization's mission at OSMP, and then how you serve people with disabilities. Sounds great. Uh, so I'm Topher Downham. I've been with the city of Boulder geez, for almost as long as the mill levy. Um, 2001, I started working. And uh, our mission is basically, it's a land management organization owned by the city for passive recreation, uh, Basically, uh, also like history, conserving wildlife, flora and fauna, um, and making sure that uh, like there's some agriculture used too. So uh, the thing that I do with them is basically make sure that uh, everybody's included, uh, especially people with disabilities. So for the last 20 some years, I've been trying to connect people with nature through hiking, uh, information, 
Uh, we now have power assist hand bikes that we take people on uh, pretty amazing trails with. And um, yeah, just providing a lot of information for them too. Am Wonderful. I missing Thank anything, you. Angel? No, that's good. I was just slow to unmute myself. Thank you so much. Um, so next we're going to go ahead and go to Natalie. Natalie, would you please introduce yourself and let us know what um, the mission of Abby Care is and how you serve individuals with disabilities? Yes. So hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is Natalie. Um, I'm with Abby Care. So Abby Care, we are a family CNA, family caregiver program. Um, so what that means is basically for the parents or loved ones of a child with a disability, um, we provide completely like free of charge training in both Spanish and English um, for those parents to get their CNA license, and then they can get paid to caregive for their loved one. Um, we offer a pretty comprehensive, like self-paced course. So parents can complete, you know, the CNA license online. And then we only require four in-person days. Um, that's because of DORA and state standards. And then, um, yeah, those four in-person days are all over the Denver Metro and Boulder County. We service everywhere from Fort Collins all the way down to Pueblo. And then we are a huge focus on making, you know, events and community events accessible for um, these parents with children with disabilities. So we do a lot of free events within our organization for our parents. And then we also, you know, host some other or, um, events and things like that for families. And then this is fully funded through Medicaid um, or the waivers, the waiver programs. So, yeah, that's me. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can't wait to learn a little bit more about Abby Care. And um, I think that our other two panelists still haven't hopped on yet. But as many of you know, you there's a lot of um, acronyms and a lot of specialized terminology when we talk about disability services. So we'll do our best um, to try to um, break those down so that we can make it accessible to everybody. Jessica? Yeah, I believe Stephanie was able to join on her phone. Stephanie, okay. are you there and able to introduce yourself and your program? Um, if not, we can come back. Maybe not. Okay. I'm sorry, did you say something? Uh, we're looking for Stephanie O'Neill to unmute herself is what oh, we're looking okay. on. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I know Belinda, you just jumped on, but um, Stephanie, I believe that you have to do like star six to unmute yourself on your phone, but if that doesn't work, um, go ahead and message us and we'll try to figure it out on the back end. I just clicked ask to unmute. But, okay, well, we'll go ahead and move on uh, while we're waiting for Robert and Stephanie to hop on. Um, just so you all know, um, <clears throat> Robert, he works with Workforce Boulder County, and um, he helps um, do job placement for individuals with disabilities and try to overcome some of those barriers to employment. And then I see that Stephanie O'Neill just hopped on, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to her if she's ready. Um, Stephanie works with the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, but Stephanie, would you please introduce yourself? Talk a little bit about your organization's mission and how you serve individuals with disabilities. Yeah, hi everyone, sorry I'm late. Um, my name is Stephanie O'Neill. I'm a program manager with Dr. Mack. Um, we, in a nutshell, um, we're a nonprofit that provides transit resources to the community. Um, so we've been doing that for, I don't know, like 19 years at this point maybe. Um, and historically, um, we've always um, worked with um, older adults and people with disabilities um, to provide travel training and teach folks how to use transit, um, connect folks to different transit resources like paratransit, um, and then also just, just in general advocating and educating folks on um, different ways we can improve accessibility um, and access to transportation resources. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And um, why don't we go ahead and stop sharing the screen, Maya? That way we can see our panelists as they speak. Uh, but we'll go ahead and go to the next question. Um, so the next question is really about challenges. So what do you think are some of the biggest challenges or gaps that are fa um, currently facing individuals with disabilities? And I'll go ahead and call you all in order. We'll start with Topher this time. So really the biggest challenges and gaps that are facing individuals with disabilities. Uh, that's a great question. I thought about it a lot in the last couple of days. 
Um, I mean, there's two that I, I see, like, just as far as enforcement, we need, like, a watchdog that can help enforce these regulations that we have that uh, uh, are helping us with our disabilities. Uh, the other thing that I, I've been, that drive me nuts right now are the Lime scooters. Um, so I think one of our biggest challenges is, is going to be micro mobility, like, uh, and not, like, managing that right. It seems like like all these B cycles and Lyme things always get left like right in the way of everybody. Um, so I think we're really going to have to step up our uh, enforcement of of micro mobility. Yeah, that is um, really kind of um, that point where the right of way isn't being managed, um, and it's really a change of paradigm, right? So enforcement. I hear you there with the ADA enforcement. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to go ahead and go to um, to Natalie for your question. So what do you feel like are some of the biggest barriers or gaps that are facing individuals with disabilities? Yeah, I think um, just kind of sometimes, especially within like transportation, um, the length of time that it takes for an individual to get from point A to point B, right? Like where are we kind of going? Um, I think for us too, it correlates a lot more to like the parents or caregivers trying to get to in-person days. I've had parents telling me, you know, it shouldn't be taking, you know, two, three hours to get from, you know, let's say like one in Denver, a good example is like, I had one parent that was like, oh, I'm trying to get to a clinical in Cherry Creek and I'm coming from Littleton and that's taking three hours right now on buses, which it shouldn't be that that's just a little bit ridiculous um and for time and especially when you're a parent with a child with a disability that's just like not very feasible so I would say that that's my biggest um you know I think pain point for the disability community but then also for parents of children with disabilities especially when they need training or they need to get kids to therapies it shouldn't be taking you know for hours to get there yeah, that is challenging. And then it's not just the amount of time, it's also like the predictability, right? Because like um, the demand responsive nature of accessor ride is challenging to get somewhere at a specific time sometimes. But yeah, that's great. Um, next person that I'm going to call on is Stephanie. So from Dr. Mack's perspective, what do you see as the biggest challenges or gaps um, that the disability services community has um, for facing people with disabilities? Yeah, so um, definitely, like Natalie just said, I think the amount of time it takes to complete a trip um, and kind of along those lines, the amount of um, time that kind of goes into like finding resources, I think it can be really exhausting to, you know, you're even if you call us, you know, you're given a list of phone numbers and names, but then you have to, you know, reach out to them yourself or have someone do that. And I think that can be a really tiring process. Um, and then also just the amount of resources that are available um, in like more rural counties um, for us, like Douglas County, Adams County, um, even up in Clear Creek and Gilpin, and there just aren't as many resources and the ones that maybe do exist are really expensive. So I think that cost is definitely a, a huge barrier for person paratransit, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rebecca, I think you kind of alluded to this in your opening, but um, from the IDD mill levy standpoint, what do you feel like are the biggest challenges or gaps for individuals with disabilities? So because I, I kind of deal with the entire whole being, I went a little beyond transportation. <laughs> um, early identification and systems navigation. Um, this is a very difficult maze for parents to traverse. And so we actually, recognizing this, Boulder County did take a pioneer's, pioneering step by establishing the first systems navigator for IDD, um, BI, and autism in the state. And this role has been very crucial in guiding individuals and families through this, these systems that they need to be in. The other real priority need is housing, which comes in, you know, has a kind of a segue into transportation as well. Housing is a fundamental need, and it's also a major challenge for our community. Um, we are looking at different approaches to bring housing into Boulder County. Uh, we want to develop a, a comprehensive housing navigation plan that's tailored specifically to this population. And we have to be able to have affordable, accessible, and safe housing options 
um, and also proactive residential support services. The other critical need um, and gap is mental health services. We do not have enough therapists that have the knowledge and the expertise to provide services for this disability population. We are currently working on training therapists and hopefully we'll be bringing the START program, which is a crisis prevention program for dual diagnosis into Boulder County. The other one is inclusion and community engagement. Transportation has a big role in that. Without transportation, we can't get our clients to community activities so they can be included. Um, social isolation was really really went downhill during COVID and it really isn't back up there again. Um, we promote self-advocacy through training and we did put out an RFP recently in order to increase social activities and recreational activities, which will be provided in book for Boulder County residents. And then there's just also a real critical need for community-wide training initiatives. And this includes educating key groups such as first responders, legal services, victim service centers, seniors and recreation centers on what effective communication strategies and guidance in connecting these individuals with appropriate services are. Um, this really means we're also doing training with Boulder County employees and partners so that they can provide inclusive and supportive environments. Um, it's just really a collaborative effort from all sectors of our community that we need and because we want these individuals to thrive as valued neighbors and community members. Yeah, that's a wonderful list. <clears throat> I think that we also probably would tie into um, some of the workforce initiatives that Robert would talk about um, when he's here, but we'll go ahead and give you his contact information afterwards um, so you can reach out to him. Um, it's just a whole system, right? Um, I love how you pointed that out because it is the social determinants of health um, and transportation is just one element of that. I appreciate that. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with Natalie for the next question. And you kind of talked about this before, but it's specific to transportation challenges. So um, you mentioned a little bit about the length of time that families are facing, but can you speak a little bit more to like the impact that those transportation barriers have on people's quality of life and on the individuals? Yeah, that's huge. Um, so like, especially in the disability community, um, there's a high need for, and I think, you know, Stephanie or Rebecca, even Topher touched on this, um, that leads to that issue with access to a resource, right? A lot of um, families need access to therapies. And if they can't get access to the therapy or they can't, you know, it's taking way too long to go to therapy, then they're not, ju they're just not going to go. Um, and then that can affect kind of like those long-term, you know, effects within their disability, right? Like if you're not able to access like a speech therapist or an occupational therapist, that could make a huge difference in development, especially with a child or also, you know, just for quality of life for that parent, right? Because if they're working on strategies, they're working with the therapist, it can make a huge difference. Um, so I think that's a piece. And then I think another piece too is just understanding to like, yeah, how can we get families to where they need to be? Or another thing is too, community is huge for families. Um, families crave it because they feel very alone, especially when they have a child with a disability. Um, they're desperate and the individual with a disability, right? If you're not seeing other individuals with disabilities, just like you, it can be a really isolating um, life, right? You don't really have anyone else that understands you or gets where you're at. So I think too, when you have these long wait times trying to get on a bus or, you know, the access ride isn't coming, it's like, okay, then maybe I just won't go, right? Like, I think that's anyone that's natural. Um, but I think too, especially in the IDD and then in the disability community, this is a whole added layer, right? Because you're already feeling alone. So if you add another layer of like, I can't even access it, then how, you know, how can you do it, I guess? So that's what I would say. Yeah, it's really hard with like barrier after barrier. It's not just the transportation barrier. It's the other things that kind of compound, which I think is good for us to remember. Um, Stephanie, I know you also talked a little bit about transportation challenges, but would you like to elaborate a little bit more on what are those key barriers? You talked about cost and like rural trips. Um, and then what is the impact of those barriers on people's quality of life? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. I think I accidentally mostly answered this question in my last one, but um, yeah. So like, for example, um, you know, we get a lot of folks who call asking for, for trips for like doctor's appointments from like Douglas County. We even get some down from Colorado Springs and there's just, there aren't those resources even available um, even for, for pay. Um, so, you know, folks are missing their doctor's appointments. They're not able to make it to the grocery store, pick up their prescription. And then that has, you know, all these adverse effects that kind of flow down the stream. And um, I think it's just, it's really important to, to keep advocating for those resources and we're constantly Googling and digging for those resources and having those conversations. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it all, it all trickles downstream. And if you miss, you know, you can't get out of the house, you have that isolation, you can't, you know, maybe get a job, you can't afford then to have um, a paid ride, and then you can't afford to go to the grocery store and things like that. So it all just kind of, kind of trickles down and really just impacts your quality of life in a negative way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and Rebecca, we'll go ahead and circle back to you. You mentioned um, some transportation challenges, but what are some of those key barriers that you are seeing um, for accessing transportation resources and what impact does that have on the people you serve? Thank you. So the needs assessment really addressed that we have a widespread gap in understanding the availability of transportation options in our community. Um, many individuals and families just not are are not aware of the services that are available to them. And um, that hinders their ability to access, as everybody else said, essential services and participate fully in community life. So um, this was highlighted throughout the needs assessment. And transportation isn't just about getting from point A to point B. Um, it is a key determinant for achieving the self-advocacy, the social connectedness, and the community engagement that this population really needs to thrive. And um, so I often equate it, what if you and I couldn't you know, access transportation, what would our lives be? And that is often what um, people with disabilities feel. I really um, liked Natalie's comments. When I was a day program supervisor, I would have participants for the day program come in wet because they were on Accessoride for so many hours. That's really inexcusable and it's unacceptable. Would we accept that for ourselves? And so that's, those are the kinds of things that we need to understand. It's also very embarrassing for people with disabilities to be on transportation too long and, and, and their needs not being met. So I just, um, it, we, you know, a lot of times there's reliability issues with some of the transportation for disabilities. There's underfunding and there's inconsistencies in service availability. So those are the barriers that I really see. Um, those are critical components. And, and transportation is a critical component in everybody's daily needs. Yeah, yeah. And that I like how you talked about that, like predictability, right? Because when you have that window of time um, to for drop off for access ride, let's mm -hmm. say, um, then you have to make sure that you're going to not be late for work, especially if you're working in the service sector. And so you have to have your drop off time be like 15 minutes at least prior to like when you have to go to work. And there's not a lot of flexibility in some of the service sector jobs for like being late due to transportation. So it also, can be being too, also being too early because yes. many of my clients when I was with DVR would be too early and they'd have to be waiting outside for a half an hour, an hour without any kind of supervision. So yeah. I think that it's not acceptable um, to treat people with disabilities. I want the inclusivity. People with disabilities yeah. deserve the same services that all of us have. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Topher, um, as far as like with OSMP, um, Open Space and Mountain Parks, um, what transportation challenges do you see and um, how does that impact people that you serve? Um, well, it's very similar to what Natalie and Rebecca and Stephanie have been saying. Um, the, the public transportation isn't the greatest to get to our uh, trailheads right now. So uh, you have to figure out a way to get there. It takes forever. Uh, by the time you get there, you're exhausted. Um, and I mean, even even with myself, I drive and I will go to a trailhead 
search for the disabled spot. And then I'll get done with my hike and find like somebody's parked in the hash lines. So I can't actually get back into my car after the hike. So there's there's all these barriers that we're dealing with that are that take away the spoons. I, I know you've all heard the spoon theory. So we end up using all our spoons just to get somewhere and get back. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that that's how it impacts them. But it also uh, limits our options of actually getting into nature and uh, getting that healing experience like a lot of other people. Yeah, and I know that we sometimes get calls for like how to get places on transit or other modes to get to recreation. And I I see like a missing link is also not knowing which trails are accessible, which I know the city of Boulder's done a wonderful job of creating the accessible guide, but not a lot of places. So you don't know like what's going to be accessible once you get there. Um, so it's not only at least what we've experience it's not only just getting there it's knowing what the conditions are going to be like when you're there too definitely yeah yeah wonderful um so this next question we'll go ahead and start with stephanie so it's really about best practices so um what are some examples of effective disability services um that you um or providers that you've experienced um and like like kind of best practices like what programs have good practices that you've seen yeah, um, I think one of our, our current partners that we work with for our travel training program, and I know that you all have worked with them as well, but um, the Center for People with Disabilities, I think they're they're doing a really great job at like at the collaboration piece. I feel like something that is just kind of stays true through through whatever you're doing, but is is really like having those conversations and listening to the community to figure out what is actually needed rather than just, you know, assuming like, oh, you need this. And um, they they partnered with us for one of our travel training sessions um, to kind of help supplement some of the, the learning skills that would be needed to, to take that training. And um, I think just, yeah, just kind of the collaboration and, and having those conversations is really the, the best way to to learn and um, Uber even, we had um, some conversations last fall. Um, they had reached out to us to get some feedback and some testing done and um, were able to implement those changes and we were able to connect them directly with some of our um, partners and community members with disabilities. And um, it's just, it's really nice to, to have those types of companies and organizations wanting to have those conversations and learn and, and advocate and things like that. Yeah, that's great. And I think one, uh, we did invite CPWD to attend today, but they were, they had another event. Um, but one thing that I really enjoy with CPWD is that they have a mandate that 50% of their board be individuals with disabilities. And I believe they also have, they try to hire um, individuals with disabilities to make up at least 50% of their workforce as well. Um, so that's great. Just that like user perspective. Um, Rebecca, in your opinion, I know you have a lot of organizations and um, family members on your advisory board, but what are some of the best practices that you see? What are examples of effective disability services and programs that you've encountered? Well, with our um, RFP process, actually, we did award CPWD funding um, for an employment coordinator. And part of that position is actually going to be working on transportation needs for employment. So I, that's coming up. I'm really anxious to get that going. Um, we also, other things, we're funding Ignite Sports. They're going to increase some, um, I don't know if anybody knows of them, but they're up at Eldora. And it's a skiing program. And um, it's just very exciting that we're going to be working with them to increase those recreational activ activities. Um, the Play Expand program remains committed to offering um, really vital services and programs to individuals with disabilities in our community. Um, that happens at the recreational centers in Boulder. Um, we've recently allocated more funding to provide more staff for more classes. And um, also our systems navigation position has proven to be very highly effective. Um, it does assist individuals with disabilities in navigating complex systems. But I also wanted to give a shout, shout out to you, Angel, because um, you guys have been very collaborative. Um, you have attended so many fairs 
where there are um, for individuals with disabilities and family with disabilities. And that outreach is just essential in this disability community. They don't always get the same information that you and I do. So by attending these outreach fairs, I think it has increased that opportunity um, for you to be able to provide education for what is available. Well, thanks for that shout out. I appreciate it. Um, it's great working with you and everybody else on the call here. Um, so Topher, um, what examples of best practice have you seen um, for programs or services? All right. Yeah, I was kind of trying to figure out how to incorporate transportation into this one, uh, but it's more programming. Uh, I've seen some really good programs like with Staunton. They have a track chair program, have a really good uh, uh, reservation system, uh, great volunteers. Uh, the Lockwood Foundation, too. Uh, they're doing amazing things to get uh, people with limited mobility up to the top of peaks and stuff. And they have like a huge volunteer base, so they can get tons of people to help out. And uh, yeah, th those are two that I see that are just just getting people connected with nature and getting them out there. Yeah, wonderful. And as you said before, there's like restorative, like being in nature, like helps with mental health, like helps with physical health. So that's great. Um, yeah. Last but not least, Natalie, for you, like what are some of the examples of best practices um, or effective disability services or programs that you've encountered with Abby Care? Yeah, no, I feel like the biggest pieces have been, um, you know, figuring out too, like we've worked with somewhat like of the Uber, like Stephanie was mentioning, like showing interest, wanting to be able to collaborate, getting individuals where they need to be, um, especially individuals with disabilities. Um, I will say too, I think something else that is huge is I think like those ski programs and things like that, especially for children is a great way to kind of like get them interested. I've seen it at Eldora myself in person. And I think it is really cool to see getting kiddos out there, getting them in nature, getting them to try activities that otherwise there wouldn't be any sort of accessibility for them. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Um, so kind of moving on to the next question here. Um, we have people on the call that represent the government sector, nonprofit sector, and the private sector as well. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what your thoughts are, um, and we'll go ahead and start with Rebecca on this. Like, what are the roles that you see for government programs versus nonprofit programs and private sector programs? Like what are the roles between those and how do they step up in different ways? Well, um, I view transportation as a fundamental right to all of us. And so I, I think that we have to ensure inclusivity. Um, it's crucial to get adequate funding and also, but foster that collaboration within our partners. Um, we need to pool our resources, but also our, our expertise. I don't always have expertise on transportation, right? So I need to I need to go out and collaborate with those people that do. Um, I think there can be a lot of public private partnerships and community based organizations that can help us with transportation, um, because transportation really does ensure that everyone, regardless of ability, can have access to what they need in the community. Um, I also feel that we can do more ensuring that businesses in Boulder County are accessible and inclusive um, because that's really critical for the well-being of our community. Um, that would be um, business education programs that really empower local businesses with knowledge and resources because we want we want that accessibility in Boulder County. We want to be known as an accessible county for everyone. So I just think that by educating businesses, uh, we also create environments within our community where individuals with disabilities can shop, they can dine, they can participate in, in community activities and have that ease and dignity that all of us deserve. Yeah, I love that you say like is an ease and dignity. I think when we were doing our mobility and access for all ages and abilities plan, that's one thing that we heard mm -hmm. um, quite loud and clear um, from focus groups with individuals with disabilities is that dignity piece, right? Like mm -hmm. how do we ensure that, yeah, people are treated equitably. Um, so Topher, we'll go ahead and start with you or we'll go ahead and transition to you. Like what role do you think the government, nonprofits and private sector play in advancing disability services? 
Um, I really like what Rebecca was saying. Um, I'll just say what she said. Now, um, I think it's real important to uh, make sure uh, that these private businesses are actually including people with disabilities. And uh, I, I think about this a lot. It's like, how do we as government organizations and uh, nonprofits support that? Like, uh, can we come up with like uh, stipends and uh, scholarships and stuff for builders that are uh, putting a rooftop on? I mean, I, I always think about rooftop bars. I, I love being up on top with everybody else. And it's like, how do we like uh, give them extra money so they can actually put an elevator in so we can all get up to the top? Um, I think that's how uh, the government or organizations can support the private. Um, but I also, as far as like uh, being out in nature and all that, uh, this is where I have to kind of speak to what we're doing too. Um, and uh, Natalie was mentioning like having that community and stuff in one of the previous questions. We do a thing called roll and scroll. And uh, it's for people with disabilities, families with disabilities. And uh, sorry, my blood pressure is a little low right now. Um, so that's why I'm all wiggly and stuff. But uh, the uh, these roll and strolls are for families with disabilities. And it's a good opportunity to go hiking once a month. We pick a different trail along the front range and uh, all the families come and like, uh, for like the first half of the th the hike, they're actually kind of bitching to each other about all the problems with accessibility and with like Medicaid and everything. And then the second half, you know, everybody's kind of calmed down and uh, they're just enjoying each other's company and being in nature. And um, it's just a real good time to like kind of hang out and uh, have that community again. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love it. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to Natalie. Um, in your opinion, like what role does government, nonprofit, and private sector play in disability services? Yeah, I mean, I think government is huge because it makes the most like long-term impacts, right? Like the government is going to make those decisions that are going to affect everyone. So I think collaboration is huge, right? Like private sector, nonprofits really need to work on that communication because I think often, you know, we run into this like, Topher was explaining, parents are complaining, Medicaid, why are they not listening to me or, you know, upset? And I think the hugest piece is making sure, okay, us and like more nonprofit or private sector are connected with government so that we hear each other out on those concerns, right? And figuring out how do we make this accessible and making sure those concerns are voiced. Um, I think communication and collaboration, I think is the hugest piece for that. Yeah. That's great. And I know, um, Medicaid coming up again, I think um, that seems to be like a common gripe that we've hear, we hear as well. And it's not just people like people in the public not knowing how to navigate Medicaid. It's also government programs not knowing how to navigate Medicaid and like refer people like so that's definitely a challenge and I appreciate you all bringing that up. Um, Stephanie, um, since you all are a wonderful nonprofit, like what do you feel is the role of like governments, nonprofits and private sector in all of this? Yeah, um, kind of similar to, to what everyone's said so far, but I think that from like a nonprofit, a, very, a small nonprofit perspective, I think like we we look to like the government and the private sector as like not only partners, but like a lot of our funding comes from there, right? So without, without those collaborations, without those partnerships, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Um, and I, I do really appreciate a lot of those, those funding opportunities and those partners are asking for our input and, you know, we're approached by like, you know, CDOT, if they have, if they have questions, like, you know, they're, they're the Department of Transportation, they know a lot, but if there's something that they're like, you know, maybe we should just get some more input, um, they, I think, do a really great job at, at connecting with the community and hope hoping, nope, hosting, there we go, hosting um, sessions for folks to come in and, and give their opinion on different projects they're doing and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, without funding, I think a lot of nonprofits wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, one thing that didn't necessarily come up as much, or maybe um, Topher and Rebecca, you might have touched on it a little bit, but just kind of channeling my CPWD like hat here. Um, one thing that I've heard them talk about a lot is that private sector, you don't always know what is accessible. They might technically be accessible, but it's not practically accessible. So for example, they might have 
a large restroom, but it you wouldn't be able to actually like turn around in your wheelchair. Um, so I think there's kind of goes back to that finding information. Like, how do you find information about like what is accessible from trails to like restaurants to government programs, right? And so that navigation bit um, seems to continually come up as Rebecca talked about with the resource navigation being important. So we'll go ahead and um, go to the next question. And I think all, all four of you have really talked about this throughout, but um, it's about collaboration. So can you give examples of successful collaboration between the sectors to enhance disability services? And I know that you've talked about this a little bit here and there, but we'll go ahead and start with Topher. Um, can you give an example that maybe um, hasn't been brought up yet or maybe go a little bit more in depth for an example that has been brought up already? Yeah, um, well, a couple of examples. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff with VIA right now um, and Golden West. So we're doing roll and strolls for uh, uh, older folks and uh, we're doing them like during the day. And uh, we're actually going to be doing one September 19th. Uh, and it's a big, I think it's going to be like a big uh, party to celebrate VIA too, if, uh, if it all comes together. Um, and but but I love like working with everybody and it seems like everybody has that kind of same goal is to get everybody out there. Same with uh, like the park to park and the El Dorado shuttle. Those are accessible. And that's taken a lot of different groups to, to get it going, like Community Vitality, Visitor Center Bureau, CPW, VIA. Um, I'm probably forgetting one. Us. Yeah, OSMP. Um, and I'm sure there's other ones that have helped, too. But uh it's it's great that we can get people at least during the summer out to these trails. Yeah, it's wonderful. And then also even CDOT with the bus staying to Estes Park, right? So that's some great examples of accessing nature, accessible paths um, with transit. Um, Natalie, can you talk a little bit about collaboration and what have been some successful examples that you've seen with Abby Cares? Yeah, so I mean, we are a family CNA program, right? So we're providing that free CNA training and then we're dealing a lot with, you know, how do we get a license? How are exams? So I think something that we're really trying to work on is work with kind of more of those government entities to figure out, okay, how do we make this more accessible for various languages? Um, because right now you can take like a written test for a CNA exam in Spanish, but a skills exam isn't in Spanish. We're trying to figure out how do we advocate for this? How do we make it, you know, more accessible? We are giving those clear, I think another huge thing that government agencies would like or prefer is like what concrete examples can we give, right? Are there families that want to like speak to this or individuals with disabilities that want to speak to this? Because I think that's a huge piece is really hearing from the individuals that are most affected. Um, and I think we've seen that make the most difference, especially too with, we work again, a lot with Dora as well, um, which is licensing to get that CNA license and the nursing exams and things like that. Yeah, it's, that's great. Language access is huge. Um, I know that um, just with Dr. Mack, we've talked about like what languages are in need now. And especially with the new refugee communities, like, um, you know, Dari, Pashtun and Ukrainian are really important, which they weren't as in, like, they weren't as prevalent here in our area before. So like, how do we quickly adapt? Yeah, I love language access. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, next, Stephanie, um, can you give examples about collaboration and how you've seen great examples? Yeah, um, I kind of mentioned this example briefly earlier, but um, last, I think it was last October, um, we hosted a couple of, of listening sessions with Uber um, and C some members from CPWD, community members, and then um, the Colorado Disabled Students Network. Um, and there were a bunch of different like bugs and things that weren't working on the Uber app that like screen readers were, it was kind of, it was just not working. Um, and the, um, those community members were able to share their feedback on, you know, this would actually work a lot better, or, you know, this is what I think, this is what I think. Um, and I recently checked in with Uber um, to see just kind of what was going on with that and if the, the feedback was helpful. Um, and they were actually, because of that feedback from the community, um, they were able to launch a new website 
um, where folks can go if they're experiencing any bugs at any time, they can go to this website and I can put it in the chat too, um, to like submit feedback. Um, and it also really helped educate the engineers on their team about accessibility because they were getting these, um, like, I don't know what they're called, like reports or submissions or whatever um, before, but didn't really understand the, um, like the importance of them. Um, so those conversations, um, even, you know, the, the hour or two that we spoke really helped impact, you know, folks nationally. Um, so that was a really cool, cool thing to, to happen. That's great. Wonderful. Um, so last but not least, Rebecca, what examples of um, successful collaboration have you witnessed? So um, we collaborate with many partners. Um, we provide investments um, through funding to many partners in Boulder County. Um, recently, my program has moved under the newly formed Community Initiatives Unit, which gives me more um, community facing with like the Family Resource Network. We also work very closely with the Boulder County Housing Division to address housing issues for people with disabilities. And then also we do training sessions for family and children's services. Beyond that, outside of um, government, we, as I said, we're, um, we started funding Ignite. We're also starting to fund um, a program called Inclusive Acres in Longmont, which is for children. And they offer um, outdoor kind of nature and science programs, et cetera. Uh, Community Link is getting funding to increase social activities on the weekend, which Medicaid does not pay for, including entrance fees to different um, to different sporting events, et cetera. We're funding um, Boulder County Public Health to increase their children's with special needs funding, um, which they will be outreaching to our BIPOC communities to, a to be able to get people off the wait list. So um, we have many collaborations with Imagine. Um, we fund the case management agency, A&I. Um, we fund emergency services for people within Boulder County through um, A&I. And I mentioned CPWD also. So um, we're pretty collaborative um, and partner with many agencies which provide um, those special um, resources for people. Of course, always looking at increasing um, the brain injury supports and services within Boulder County as well. And I also mentioned our expansion for play as well. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you had mentioned um, Imagine and then a and I. Um, I don't know if you want to, I'm just sure. putting you on the spot here, if you want to like talk about that recent yeah. change, because I know it's come up a couple of times. So yes. this might be a good opportunity. So due to a federal mandate and state mandate, um, case the uh, CCBs are no longer in existence. It was due to conflict of interest. Many CCBs were also direct services process. And so um, it was mandated that all CCBs um, become case management agencies by July 1st of this year. So Imagine is now going to be the PASA direct services side and A&I, um, that is um, ACMI, Adult Care Management Inc, who handles the rest of the waivers besides DD. And then Imagine, who handles all the DD waivers, they have joined forces and they have become A and I avenues, which is truly the single entry point in Boulder County for all waivers. So that is as of July 1st. And I've been working nonstop on trying to get that contract up and running. So <laughs> So I'm just putting a couple of acronyms in the chat here. So CCB was community center boards, right? And, so they and were... PASAs are program approved service agency. And Sarah is correct. Um, so the case management agency is moving to uh, Coal Creek. And imagine the direct services is moving to Dixon. So that's kind of opposite the, the way they've been. So they do have two separate buildings mm -hmm. and each one. So Imagine is no longer part of the um, case management agency. Okay. Imagine took the name over. Um, yeah. The people that go for counseling and stuff like day programs, and is that different, Rebecca? The day program would be part of the direct services. 
and yeah. that will be out and of counseling the, too. Yeah, that will be out of the other building now. They switched buildings recently. Okay, cool. I gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So just if I could recap, so previously Imagine was providing case management. So telling people what services they can go to, approving what services they can go to. Mm -hmm. And they were also offering those services, like the counseling yes. service and yes. everything else. And so the federal change said that if you're advising people on what services they need to access, you can't also provide the service. So all of the case basically, management. Basically, yeah. yes. The case management agency directs is the waiver services. So think of this, it's up above. They're the ones who decide what waivers people can be eligible for and are on, and they manage the people's cases. The direct services agency provides those services that they need in order to complete their plan. Thanks for getting into that. I know I didn't prepare you for that, but uh, okay. Medicaid, Medicaid again, it's just so challenging yeah. to understand. So. <laughs> So we're moving on to our last question before we'll open it up to the um, to the attendees. So really, it's about inclusivity and what strategies do you all feel can be employed so that people with disabilities are included in decision making processes? And I'll go ahead and start with you, Natalie. Um, I'm not sure if you were next in order, but um, we'll start with you. Um, I think if you're in the private sector or in the nonprofit sector or even in the governmental sector, I think it's representation. Um, I think having individuals with disabilities kind of in every aspect makes a huge difference because when you're the individual or that person is the individual experiencing something, I think it gives this, it definitely gives the best perspective of what, you know, how to make a difference, right? Um, I think to something like Abby Care and something that I really love about our organization is we have even on staff, like a lot of these parents that have been through the family CNA, their, their child previously had a, you know, G-tube and they're no longer needing a G-tube, but they're now staffed with us full time. Um, and so I think it gives parents like, oh, you've been through this too. Um, especially when we're coming from the familial perspective, but I think to, um, yeah, just having, I think representation is huge. Yeah, thank you. Um, Stephanie, as far as Dr. Mack, um, like what do you see um, the role or how how can we basically include individuals with disabilities in decision-making processes more? Yeah, um, definitely representation. Um, and I kind of, I probably talked about it in all of my answers, but like having those collaborations and having those conversations. And I think that something we're trying to constantly do over here at Dr. Mack is like in our programming, current program and future programming process, like really laying it out and saying, you know, like each, how each piece would would work for um, for everyone, um, not even um, just people with disabilities, but um, really being mindful of that planning process so that when we go to, you know, launch something, it is accessible and then we don't have to backtrack and say, oh, wait, you know, we didn't, we forgot about this, we forgot about that, um, making sure that you're being proactive about those things and having, you know, the conversations ahead of time, I think is really important. Great, thank you. Uh, Rebecca? Um, what role do you believe, um, or how do you think we can include people with disabilities in decision-making processes more? So I know that you guys have always heard of the phrase, there is nothing about us without us. And I truly actually believe that it really encapsulates the essence of inclusion and participation. And it really asserts that no policies, decisions, or any action should be made without including people that it impacts. Um, and so I really um, am a strong believer in that, uh, in the context of housing, education, mental health, employment, and all of those daily, um, you know, things that people live we have to ask people with disabilities to co-create those items. Um, their lived experiences, their perspectives, their insights are really invaluable um, for us to um, take in consideration before moving forward. Um, so it's just, you know, it's about justice. It's about equal opportunities. It's about reasonable accommodations. And justice really demands that individuals with disabilities have equal access to all opportunities in all aspects of life. 
And I am just, you know, I've been in this field since the 1970s and I am a firm believer that you include the people that the services are going to affect. You get their opinions um, because if number one, if you don't have buy-in, it's not gonna work. And also let's use people with lived experiences to make decisions about housing, et cetera, in Boulder County. Great, thank you, Rebecca. And last, um, Topher, um, what do you think we can do to include individuals with disabilities in decision-making processes more? Uh, what, what Natalie said earlier about like hiring people that are representing all the different uh, people and, um, and I, I think one good example that I see right now is the state of Colorado and uh, Governor Polis has created like that Colorado Disability Opportunity Office. And I've been asked to be on just tons of different committees like destination stewardship and inclusivity and travel and the outdoor equity. And um, I, I actually don't have time to be on all these different boards. So it'd be great to get other people involved too. Um, but but they're asking us the questions now. And uh, I think that's great. Uh, I, I also think that they should hire, not just get people to volunteer with disabilities. That seems to be a, a theme, like they'd rather have us do it for free. Um, and that kind of takes away the, the value. Um, and I think we all have value and hiring us and paying us gives us that value. Um, yeah, there, there was something else I was gonna say about that too. Um, it, uh, just a quick anecdote, like for many years, like I'd be working at the farmer's market at our booth and people would always be like, oh, are you volunteering? And it's like, no, I, I'm i I'm managing this crew right here. I have a disability, but I'm working. And I wanna get, I think we need to get rid of that stigma in, uh, in our society and culture. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. That's a good note to, good note to end on, getting rid of um, the stigma and making sure that we're paying people for the work they're doing. Um, so I'm going to open it up to everybody else to ask some questions. I just was looking through the chat and it looks like Sarah had a few comments about um, just in general, like Accessoride and um, basically the, how she had taken advantage of the skiing. Um, Sarah, do you want to add anything else or ask another question of the panelists? Oh, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed the panel. I feel like a lot of my questions were kind of addressed, but um, I was wondering for Topher, did you feel like when people tried to ask you to volunteer and stuff like as you were saying, did you feel like that was kind of tokenizing or did you feel like they were genuine? Because like sometimes, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I felt like oh, you'd be perfect for, you know, this because you're our token blind, like, girl or whatever, and I don't use that label, um, and so I don't like that, but I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah, it, it's one of those things, definitely. Like, I feel the same mm -hmm. way you do, Sarah. It's like, yeah. are you uh, uh, asking me because I'm the token guy in a wheelchair, or do you value my my experiences and everything? Um Exactly. And the whole volunteer thing too, like, I mean, I always feel like you should ask somebody uh, if they run the company before you ask if they volunteer and start. Yeah. Then, uh, I mean, not, not that volunteers aren't lower, but uh, uh, it's, that's all out of the heart. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of torn. Uh, like I, I love helping out, but I also don't want to be there just because I'm in a wheelchair or low vision or. Exactly. I agree. Right. Thanks, How do you Sarah. Think that, what oh. helps you feel? Oh, sorry. I was just curious. What helps you feel not tokenized in that way? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I think it's just from everything I've done. Like now people know me for like the guidebook and everything. And uh, I'm, I'm no longer the token. I'm the expert. Yeah. That oh, that's sense? good. I love that. <laughs> awesome. Oh, thank you. you Great. I see that Jen has her hand up. Um, I know that she's one of our very respected volunteers. Mm -hmm. I know we were talking about volunteers, but I'll hand it over mm -hmm. to her. 
I just want to say thank you to all of you. This is great. We need to see more of this because, you know, this is how we can increase our representation just by letting us know what's available. Because like Topher said, you don't want to be talking, but yeah, we are the experts, so we should be included. (laughs) Yeah. That's all. Just really thank you guys. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, does do we have any other questions before we adjourn the uh, panel discussion? We do have a couple of updates afterwards. Um okay. Just let me know. Um, if the panelists um have any of the organizations that you had mentioned that you think we should include in the follow-up newsletter please put those contacts in the chat and then, or those organizations in the chat so that we know we can reconstruct um, like what you all were talking about. I just want to thank you all for taking part in today's panel discussion. Um, It really is great to be able to hear um, cross sector perspectives on all of the disability services and just how important the work is that you all are doing and how you all prioritize collaboration and just breaking down barriers. So it's really impressive and I'm just in awe of everything that you all do. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, talk with us today. Our next, um, our next panel discussion is going to be in three months, and we're going to talk about um, medical access. So if anybody has any ideas on medical access that you want to share with us, um, we still haven't finalized those panelists yet. But thank you again, and we'll include your contact information in the follow-up email as well um, so that people can reach out to you directly. Hey, okay. Angel. Yes. Can I just add one more thing? Yeah, of uh, course. Goes along with volunteering and mm-hmm. uh, representing. Uh, you know, all of us with disabilities kind of get exhausted, like being mm-hmm. the deputized and stuff. So anybody out there that wants to help out, that wants to be an ally or an advocate for us, we love that. Um, doesn't always have to be somebody with a disability that speaks up. Yeah, perfect. Love it. Thanks. Yeah, definitely plenty of room for allyship. Um, thank you, Topher. Okay, Um, well, thank you again. And we'll uh, move on to the next slide, please, Maya. Okay, Um, I don't know if Tanya Jimenez is on the call yet. Um, We might need to skip over her and come back. Um, But I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jessica to talk a little bit about the Peak to Peak Housing and Human Services Transportation Options Meeting. Yeah, uh, thank you. So last Thursday, um, we were supporting the Peak to Peak Housing and Human Services Alliance. Um, we put together a virtual panel where we invited several transportation providers. Um, and the recording will be available soon. I know that it was definitely recorded. We had uh, providers, including VM Mobility Services, who talked about the um, program Family and Friends, Friends and Family. I always forget which one goes first, but they're together and uh, how that one runs in um, the peak to peak area. And then uh, Lisa also talked about mountain rides too. Um, and then we also had access a ride. Uh, so we had Gretchen from RTD talk about how to uh, register for access a ride and how to use it. And we also had uh, Kimberly from TransDev and she was talking about uh, non-emergency medical um trips so yeah i thought it was informative and um we will share the the video when we have it the recording yeah thank you wonderful thank you jessica and there's also we're looking at adding another day on mountain rides just so everybody knows so it looks like monday um we'll send out a finalized uh, press release once we know what day we're adding but um, thank you to Via for being a wonderful partner in that and identifying the opportunity to expand to a third day. So looking forward to that. Okay, so now we have um, some welcome to new um, new folks. So um, just I'll go ahead and introduce Gisa first. So we were in the same introduction to, um, I don't know, what was it? <laughs> Public administration class uh, a while ago when we were both in our master's program. So I'm so excited to see her at RTD, but I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Gisa, to kind of introduce yourself and talk about um, like what you'll be doing with RTD. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm super excited to join this cohort and support you all. I am Gisa Simmons. I'm the Outreach Specialist um, in the Civil Rights Division at RTD. And in that role, I support two offices, so um, the ADA office and the SBO office. And it's specifically with ADA offices, I am looking to hear of the experiences of people with disabilities to enhance our services and to make them better um, and more accessible. So I am here to learn, um, do some outreach with you all and be an advocate. So I'm very, very excited to start our working relationship and learn more. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for joining. And do you want to tell us what SBO is? I think I know, but. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, SBO is small business opportunity. So I support disadvantaged businesses, women owned minority businesses and providing um, more access to opportunities for contracts at RTD. Awesome. Great. Well, um, RTD is lucky to have you and we look forward to working with you. So thanks for joining us today. And then um, another person we're going to introduce is Paul. Um, Paul's new, our transit program manager. So Paul, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I apologize. I had to jump on late. I was on another meeting, but I uh, enjoyed the uh, second half of the panel that I heard and the input that everybody had to offer. I really appreciate uh, being able to learn through the experiences to me. I really appreciate the position I'm in uh, because I've always wanted to improve uh, access to transportation and appreciate the access that transportation gives individuals. So um, that's where I uh, put my uh, my passions and my services to um, to. I believe that transportation is a, a pursuit that is worth. Um, all my energy. So, and I look forward to uh, working. You're kind of cutting a in long and out. Time Paul. To come. <laughs> Sorry, on my side, you're cutting out. I don't know if it is for everybody. Yeah, so a little bit. Yeah. That's horrible. Oh, <laughs> well, many, we heard many. most of it. So, we're good. We heard most of it. We look forward to it. So, Paul is taking over. Um, overseeing Ride Free Lafayette, which I'm kind of excited to hand it over to him. And just so I have a little bit more time. And then also he's taking over um, the Lions Flyer. I think you already said that, but um, we're excited to have you on board and can't wait to work with you more. Um, Jen, I see your hands up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I did you want to say one thing? I know it's not really a topic, but I know as far as, because I've applied to a couple of jobs at Boulder County, but I'm always like kicked out by the um, system when they're like, oh, you're not qualified. Well, that right there is a barrier. Because I tried to apply for an ADA position, which obviously I have lived experience, but they immediately kicked me out because I didn't have a master's in, uh, like, you know, ADA or whatever. And I really think that we need to look at that because that's a huge barrier right there to keep disable people out of government positions. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, just making it through the HR screening process can be challenging. Um, yeah, I think we, we do have the new ADA coordinator on board and I will probably, I'll invite her to come give a, like a talk or just like introduce herself to, um, to the MAC coming up here. I'm excited to actually have a, like um, an ADA coordinator that's 100% just focusing on ADA issues. But thanks for bringing that up. Jessica? Yeah, uh, I just realized we had a question in the chat that we didn't get to respond. Um, oh. 
So Kara is asking, who knows the most about getting Medicaid to pay for Uber? I'm having a hard time helping my clients. So, okay. um, yeah. I don't see that one, but um, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, Rebecca, do you know much about that, getting Medicaid to pay? For Uber? No? Okay. I know that there's been like some, um, some, like um, Medicaid day programs that have been using Uber for people to go to their um, day programs, but I don't know about just getting Medicaid or getting general Medicaid for non-medical transportation approved. But I do think we can ask, uh, we'll dig around maybe um, some people um, that you know, Rebecca might know a little bit better. Jen, I see your hands um, up again. Yeah, I just want to answer that good. I have been battling with this for a while, but I know right now there's nothing in place to officially say you'll Medicaid pay for Uber, but they do a Z trip. But with that, you just have to call Z trip and tell them your Medicaid number, and that will be in your system. So that's a start. I know it's not perfect because Z-Trip is not as well known as Uber, but there's a way for right now. Yeah, thank you. I also wanted to mention the RTD Access on Demand pilot. I don't know, Kara, if you're like in, um, plugged into that. Yeah, that you do like that. Yeah, and that's a pretty generous program. So if somebody is Accessoride certified, um, then they can also apply for um, access on demand. And then they get up to 60 trips on Uber, Lyft, Z-Trip, or Metro Taxi. Um, thanks, Jessica, for putting that in the chat. Um, but they get up to 60 trips per month. Um, and that's been really a life changer for a lot of people. So um, we'll um, you can take a look at that link that Jessica has. Uh, but we also have a lunch and learn um, that we can share with you as well. So um, great. Does anybody else have anything else to say on Uber um, and Medicaid, Medicaid paying for Uber? Okay, great. Well, I don't see Tanya. I know it was a last minute ask yesterday. Um, I asked her to come talk about Willoughby Corner. So I'll go ahead and just put it in the chat and I'll do my best to give the update. So Boulder County is developing a huge de um, development in Lafayette called Willoughby Corner. Um, it's going to have 400 units available. There's, um, they're already um, starting construction. They have two phases that they're gonna be opening up the wait list for. So phase one is a senior housing site. I forget how many units there are, but it's 55 and over. Um, and then the phase two is mixed age. Um, so it's one of the few opportunities to um, get in for affordable housing. And just in general, they have different breakdowns of what is considered to be affordable. So they have low income housing, which I think is 30% area median income and below. They have a 60% threshold, which um, a lot of county employees might even qualify for, and then 80%. So Rebecca, you might know a little bit more than me. I see your hands up. No, well, I just wanted to say, yeah, the second phase I'm more involved in, I think it's 128 units. Um, we actually are going to be developing affordable, accessible housing units for our population in phase two. Okay. Great. So I just wanted to kind of let people know that that's what we, we are working on it presently. Yeah. And so you all know, we've been working with uh, BCHA, Boulder County Housing Authority, to ensure that there's transportation options. So um, we're working on um, like secure bike parking at the senior location. Um, they have um, like enclosed bike parking at all the other like um, locations that they're going to be building. There, we're building like two, um, there's gonna be two bus stops there. Um, RTD will have a layover site there. So they'll be um, serving the locations starting next May with their May service changes. And they've been really great at ensuring that we have um, transit access um, close to the start date when they start leasing up. And then there's also Ride Free Lafayette. So I'm hope I'm really hopeful that there's a lot of transportation options at this location. So if transportation's a concern for you, 
um, it might be a good location um, in Lafayette. Okay. Anybody have anything else to say about Willoughby Corner? Okay. They're very nice looking. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. And I think in some of the later phases, there might even be affordable to buy. Um, so you would just buy like the um, the proper, the house, but not the property. So it's kind of, it's something that Boulder County Housing Authority hasn't done to date. And then also anybody who moves in will get a free eco pass that Mobility for All, um, like, op like we offer to people. Okay, um, well, I see that um, we're to the end of our agenda. So can you go to the next slide, please, Maya? Um, next slide. So we're gonna be in person in July in Longmont. I'm trying to get some of the Longmont um, specific planning effort presentations on the books for that. Um, it's accessible by transit. So it's only like two blocks from the 8th and Kaufman. Um, it's a little bit challenging to come from Denver to Longmont, though, because the LD1 doesn't run super frequently. Um, but just we look forward to seeing you. We'll have some snacks. Um, we'll be talking about the Mobility and Access for All Ages and Abilities Plan. And we'll get some updates on like what progress we've made on that. And we'll also talk about like next steps um, in the implementation of that. So thank you all for joining us this month um, and we'll be on for another five minutes or so if anybody has an update that they want to share. Thanks Lindsay for sharing the giggle, the giggle video. You're welcome. Um, one thing that I was gonna share and I'll put this in the chat too, is that um, we have an event coming up called uh, Help for the Journey. It's for caregivers of older adults um, and gives tips on you know caring for yourself as a caregiver, caregiving for those with dementia and more. So I'll just drop that registration right into the chat. Perfect, and we'll include it in our follow-up uh, newsletter as well. Angel, I just wanna um, say that we have openings on our advisory council. I'd love to have people apply for that. Uh, I think we have like three. They're doing okay. a mid, <clears throat> they're doing a mid year um, yeah. announcement. So it closes July 7th. Okay, please um, give us a little write up and we'll include it in our newsletters. Um, okay. Our bilingual newsletter is going out um, on the 1st of July, but we have our Mac newsletter that's going out this week. So we'd love to include that. Thank you. Great. And um, Zoe, do you want to talk about your blog post, your accessible transportation blog post, or are you just putting that in there? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to chat a little bit about it. Um, essentially, there are uh, there is a growing need for accessible transportation in our community, especially as the aging population grows larger and larger. We are living through a historic event. This has never happened before in the United States or maybe anywhere else on the planet. Um, so how do we, how many more people need human services? How many people need accessible transportation? How are we as a community going to come together and serve everyone who needs such services? Um, this, this article gets a little bit into that. It also um, provides some quotes from people who are not receiving the level of services that they need to be connected within the community. Um, the, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of promotion about donating to VIA, but the meat of this blog post is demand is increasing. What does that mean for our community? So that's a little bit about that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Love it. Okay. And if anybody has anything else they want us to include in the newsletter, please put it in the chat. And Maya's pulling that together after this, um, after this meeting today and tomorrow, and we'll send that out. Thank you all for joining us. It was great seeing everybody's face.